Good morning, um, and thank you very much for coming. I think I'm going to feel very much like the thorn between two roses when we're all done here. I have a great amount of respect for John Fiscalini. John and I have known each other for a while. Um, always a straightforward and um, great individual to know. The person that's following me, uh, Doug Young. I'm kind of introducing Doug so he doesn't have to. I would call him the, the father of dairy farmer sustainability in New York State. Don't leave, John. Don't leave. <laughs> I'm going to only say good things about you. Uh, so uh, I was asked to provide the um, informed dairy farmer perspective on sustainability and climate change. And I, I'll tell you what, does anybody else want to do this talk? Because <laughs> I, 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 Kurt Gooch, thank you very much. It was... Um, it was not exactly what I was hoping to um, have a topic of. But anyway, so my name is Skip Hardy. I'm a dairy farmer. Actually, in Tompkins County, our farm is about, I don't know, I've never really measured it, but 10 to 15 miles north of here, very easy to get to. For you locals, we're right next to Baker's Acres. Um, wife Holly, four children. Um, Ben's an engineer. Caitlin's an accountant. Joe is a world traveler. And Adam works for Cargill Animal Nutrition. Um, I'm a member of the staff and ownership of Walnut Ridge Dairy. Um, 1,400 cows, 2,000 acres owned and rented. Um, kind of intimidated. Um, actually, I'm kind of glad. I don't see as many dairy farmers in the audience as I thought I was going to see, so I feel a lot better. I won't lie, but at least I won't. I maybe can nudge the truth a little bit. But anyway, so who is who is Walnut Ridge Dairy? Um, this, is, this, this slide is a picture of the farm that my parents bought in 1951. Um, that's the house. I was a year old when, uh, when they bought it. That's the house we moved into. My um, mother's mother wasn't impressed by the barn at all. She was completely unimpressed by the house because you could see through it without looking through a window. Um, so uh, we've, come, we've, come, we've come quite a ways. Uh, so 1951, my parents, my father was a uh, Cornell graduate. Met my mother here at Cornell. They're both from Long Island. One grandfather commuted into New York City every day, and actually he's the one responsible for a lot of these old pictures. He was a magazine publisher. My mother's father was an MD. and um, So 14 cows, 1951. Uh, 1960, um, my father loved farming, just wasn't terrific at some aspects of it. Decided he needed help uh, to, to up his game a little bit. Went into partnership with uh, another Cornell graduate named John Hicks. Um, partnership was quite successful. They both did well, uh, so well that John got an offer to take over ownership and management of a, a, a good, prosperous dairy farm, actually between our farm and Ithaca. So he's even closer. Uh, so that uh, partnership ended. Um, my father then went into partnership with a fellow named Dennis Eldred. Dennis uh, graduated from Cornell, I think, in 69 or 70, not sure. Um, and again, my father was looking for somebody with talent and drive and passion, um, hired Dennis, um, roughly 250 cows. Um, Dennis is, if anybody knows Dennis Eldred, hell of a manager. Um, he might <laughs> My father tussled a little bit, if you can believe that. Anyway, um, I can tell by no laughter they don't know Dennis very well. Uh, or my father, for that matter. Um, uh, Dennis decided it was time for him to move on after five or six years, I believe. And, um, and it was pure coincidence. I was making my mind up that maybe I wanted to be a dairy farmer. Uh, I would never wanted to be a dairy farmer. I went to Michigan State. Um, I was a labor industrial relations. Um, I was going to work for the union. Um, <laughs> I ended up skiing and surfing instead. That was <laughs> close. Um, so when Dennis left, I was on my way home. Um, 1977, my father and I went into partnership. I worked for him for a couple of years, um, and we formed Hardy Family Farms. We had a couple hundred cows. Um, I realized pretty much the same thing my father realized, and that was um, I wasn't that great a dairy farmer. I just enjoyed it. Um, so I went looking for somebody that I thought would make not just a good partner, but a good lifetime partner in a business. Um, I was looking for a person who would manage the herd and manage all the things that went along with the herd. Um, and I hired a fellow named Steve Palladino. Um, still with me, <laughs> still my partner. 
obviously pretty emotional. I probably should have advanced one of these things. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there's a picture of my father. And you can see by the smile on his face how uh, excited he was. I'm sure this is, again, my grandfather taking these pictures. You know, um, who's, what's not like when your son's having time of his life? Um, so um, I hired Steve in 1984, Cornell graduate. Uh, 1988, we started Hardy Farms Incorporated. And there's a picture of the illustrious crew. My parents, Dave and Joan, my wife, Holly, three of our four kids, myself, and Steve Palladino as a scruffy guy all the way to the left. Um, and at that point, we had around 400 cows. 1996, um, um, Hardy Farms, Inc. bought my father out, and so it was just Steve and I, and at the same time, we actually equaled ownership, so he and I were equal owners in Hardy Farms, Inc. at that point. Um, Year 2000, we had an employee named John Fleming, brought John into the business. Um, John's forte was and still is um, crops and feeding. Um, year 2000, 800 cows. Um, so then fast forward to, two, and you know, lots of other things have happened, obviously. 2013, um, I've been raising my hand. I gave um, Steve and John notice that I would want to start uh, cutting back on management and ownership, um, and I gave him a five-year um, uh, window in which to kind of start phasing me out. That meant that Steve really needed to have somebody take his place as herd manager because Steve was going to be rising up to take my spot as general manager. Um, so 2013, we found Keith Chapin, um, wife Beth, three little kids, Owned a bunch of cows, uh, lost lease on, lease on his barn, and was looking for uh, something similar to what we could offer, and that was shared ownership, shared management, shared responsibility, shared benefits. Um, I think he was, he was it, it was good that Keith had um, worked his butt off by himself to get where he was, because now he was ready to actually kind of come into a situa situation like we have. So. Uh, Keith came in, Har Walnut Ridge Dairy uh, was formed. There's um, four good-looking guys. Um, <laughs> Steve, closest to me, myself, Keith with uh, more hair than all the rest of us put together, and John with a hat on. Um, so, um, what's the future of Walnut Ridge Dairy? No, not sure. Um, I actually am going to predict the future in a, here in a little while, but I'm not going to do it right now. Um, all I know is that our dairy is set up from an ownership and management standpoint as, as well as I could do it. Um, we're, we're looking towards the future. We're actually in the middle of building a 60-stall rotary right now. So farm philosophy real quickly, families first, not just the families of these four people, families of all our employees. Um, we have a lot of long-term employees. We have a lot of Hispanic employees. I really don't even like to make that distinction. They're great people, and I enjoy them all. Um, share business ownership with non-family. Why do we do that? Now, I, Hans, uh, your yesterday, talked about you know having to have farm kids become farmers, uh, and I disagree. I thought I saw you. I disagree to a certain amount. I want my children, I want my partner's children to do whatever they want. I want them to feel no obligation to come home. I would absolutely love it if any or, or all of our children, well, if all of them came home, that would be a challenge, but, <laughs> um, but, but I, I, and my parents raised me this way, you know, I never was going to be a dairy farmer. Loved the farm, just never wanted to be a dairy farmer. Um, so uh, on the other hand, I think it's the responsibility of dairy farmers to propagate the next generation or two from whatever source. Um, the other thing I, I like about uh, shared business ownership is um, I have a, a son who's an engineer, and if he decides to ever come back to the farm, I'm going to have to deal with an engineer. That may or may not be what our farm needs at that point. Um, whereas if I, so we're actually looking, so Keith was the last partner to come in. We're looking for what we call the next Keith. At some point here in the next four or five years, um, we can we know what we're going to need. We're going to need somebody that's going to be able to do assist John in the crops and machinery end of things. 
Um, and again, if a kid comes back and he doesn't have that particular talent, um, okay. The last farm philosophy is that we've uh, always been pretty progressive. Um, quite frankly, uh, it's been a fault sometimes. Um, I, just real quick, I mean, we, my father built a milking parlor in 1958, a double four swing. 1975, we built a double eight herringbone. 1989, uh, 14 a double 14 parallel, and now the 60 stall rotary. Other examples of um, some progressive things. My father built a pit silo in 1954. No concrete, just dirt. You can imagine the quality of so and no cover, obviously, either. So you can imagine that was the beginning. Now all our silos, obviously, in a pit silo. He uh, partnered with Corning Glass to put in a glass pipeline. That didn't turn out too well either. Um, Mixer Wagon, um, we we're one of the first farms, this is with Dennis and my father, to uh, have a Mixer Wagon, total mixed ration. Uh, 1975, the year I came home, um, my father was in the midst of digging a manure lagoon. Man, it looked like it would hold manure forever. <laughs> In 1976, we had to figure out how to empty it because it was full. Um, so uh, another, you know, manure irrigation seemed great. Irrigation equipment, simple, easy, you just pump it, you know. Um, 1988, um, this is largely due to Steve. Um, we were one of Monsanto's six test herds for BST. Um, and actually, we had the highest response of the six. We're still, like John, uh, strong advocates of BST, still use it. Not sure how long. Uh, 2000, um, we uh, went hook, line, and sinker into the manure drag hose uh, system. Stopped hauling, stopped irrigating, started having better relationships with our neighbors. Uh, in the year 2002, we uh, started down the path of GPS and auto steer. And that path is still progressing, quite frankly. <laughs> that's, that's a learning, that's a work in progress. All right, so finally I'm getting around to, so I've been stalling a little bit. I'm finally getting around to the sustainability part of my talk. Um, sustain, sustainability, three-legged stool. Economic, environmental, socially responsible. Not my definitions. I'm actually on the DMI board. John, John and I were on it together. This is uh, a definition I got from uh, DMI, Dairy Management, Inc. So order of importance, pretty, pretty important what your per particular perspective is, so dairy farmer, I'll say economics, right? If my business isn't successful, I'm not going to be a dairy farmer. Uh, if I'm an environmentalist, I'm probably going to say, hey, hey, let's go with the environment. And if I'm an activist, I'm also going not to not be too worried about the environment necessarily, definitely not too worried about farmers at this point, but that social responsibility thing is, is big. And so we throw all this at the consumer, and the consumer's going, okay, um, you know, I like farmers, the environment needs something, but these social activists are telling me things. It's a little confusing. So um, the order of importance does change over a period of time, obviously. Um, I'm going to go back to when I was born, 1950. There's a few older people in this room that might uh, have been around then. Um, we were just done with two world wars. We were in the middle of this Korean conflict, which obviously I don't remember this. I'm reading my history books. But the United States was flying. I mean, meaning that we were, we were like a, a, you know, a, a young boy that just figured out that, hey, at age 13, I can run faster. My voice starts dropping. I'm getting a little more active. Uh, fast forward to 2015. Um, so we've been through a period uh, of time where there's been a huge push to uh, uh, improve the environment, rightfully so. Um, we've, we've screwed that up in a lot of ways pretty badly. We're in the process now, I think, of, of hopefully starting to fix that. But we're also on the cusp of something really different as far as I'm concerned. Um, society, people, can collectively dictate their thoughts, their feelings, and their emotions in an instant. Um, <clears throat> best example is the Arab Spring. I mean, that was, I, I don't know, I didn't foresee anything like that happening. With the ability for something like that to happen so rapidly over such a large geographical area with so many people. That was just amazing. And so while the economics of um, sustainability are important, quite frankly, I think they're losing ground. All right. Um, 
So from an informed farmer perspective again, uh, dairy farmers have been operating in a continuously improving sustainable manner for a long time. Just didn't realize it. Maybe if we had found that word sustainability and introduced it ourselves, it would have been a lot better rather than somebody saying, hey, you guys, you need to be more sustainable. But we have been, but we just didn't know it. Anyway, so um, recent interest in sustainability has been driven by the three legs of my, of my milking stool. Um, keep in mind it's the economic leg, the environmental leg, and the social responsibility leg. I probably should have had a slide for this, but uh, my excuse is I just got back from a family vacation reunion in Scotland, like 24 hours ago, right? Maybe it's 30 hours now. Um, and the night before I left was not pleasant, so, or it was pleasant, but the morning after wasn't. Um, my, uh, my Scott relatives all have a favorite distillery, and I had to sample each one of them. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to try to do is, uh, uh, this is a visual, visual chart, hopefully um, your imagination can help. I'm going to give us four different uh, time slots, um, um, 1985, the year 2000, today 2015, and this is where I predict the future, 2030. And I'm going to have each one of our three um, legs of sustainability be assigned a number. And those numbers are going to add up to 10 for each particular year. So I think you'll see what I, where I'm going here in a second. Starting with 1985, my economic leg, I'm going to assign a 7. I'm going to assign my environmental leg a 3, which leaves 10 already, so 0 for um, social responsibility. I actually assigned 0 to the uh, social responsibility first, kind of worked my way backwards. Year 2000, the economic leg I took from a 7 to a 6. I took the environmental leg from a 3 to a 4. And I still left 0 for the social responsibility. I just, you know, it just, at least I didn't see it. Today, um, I took the economic leg from a 6 all the way down to a 3. Huge decrease. Again, this is me. Uh, environmental leg, I left right at, no, excuse me, I dropped it from a 4 to a 3. Um, I raised social responsibility from zero to a four. I, I mean, it's just bang. That made that much of an impact so quickly. So this is where I predict the future. We'll see. I am predicting that the economic leg will be a two. Environmental leg, environmental leg will remain as a three. And the social responsibility leg will be raised to a five. So um, we'll see. Um, and if you disagree with me, we can argue. I don't mind that at all. So what are the implications of these trends? Um, trend one is that farmers will continuously face a more difficult economic climate. Trend two is that the environmental um, leg will slow down in terms of importance, but will show steady improvement. The key is, will society be willing to fund the research to pay for the implementation of those technologies that we truly need to improve our environment. And then trend three is we baby boomers will need to continually adjust to the demands of the current generation. Uh, today it's the millennials, tomorrow it might be Gen Z or whatever. They're wealthy and they're gonna be a lot more wealthy once you and I croak, Jen, um, because they're gonna have our hard earned earning, our hard earned savings. Um, the millennials today have a strong desire to engage in what is just, fair, and good, social responsibility. They're also easily led. Uh, commitment is one of their strengths. Knowledge, I don't think it's quite as important as, as it at least would be to me personally. And by all means, emotion trumps all. The fourth trend is that transparency is becoming an absolute must. We think transparency is a big deal now in the dairy farming business it will become an even bigger deal. I predict that there'll be cameras every place, on every farm, if you want to sell milk into the dairy business. <clears throat> now to climate change. Ha! You thought sustainability was thorny. Um, actually, Bill Byrne, I saw Bill here. Uh, Bill raised an excellent question yesterday when he challenged Hans on his lack of climate information uh, in, the, in the presentation last night. Um, but I also, I also think that uh, Hans 
uh, I understand why Hans is reticent to enter that conversation. It's just difficult and a fair amount of emotion there. Um, do I believe in climate change? Yes. Um, I'm a, quote, scientific American. Probably could have been an engineer if I'd wanted to be. Uh, do I believe climate change is due to mankind? Partially. You'd have to be a fool not to believe that we don't contribute some of it. Am I going to guess what portion of climate change is due to mankind? I'm not that stupid. But I know that um, I have helped and will continue to help the environment on our dairy farm. Um, as most of us know, agriculture is a largely untapped resource for slowing mankind's impact on the environment, but farmers can't shoulder the blame. I think John was um, absolutely right with society needs to figure out what it's going to take, and then they have to be willing to sign those checks. And that's it. That's all I'm saying about climate change. And if you ask me the same question you asked Hans, I'm just going to go, I'll point to somebody else. I haven't talked much about Walnut Ridge Dairy. Um, I'm extremely proud and emotional um, about what we've accomplished. <laughs> but I don't think um, we're not done. Um, and for those of you expecting pictures of barns and kitties and calves, well, I was wasn't going to do it, but I did. Um, so pictures of a, these are, we have th four large cow barns. Um, this is the old man. He ruled the roost for a very long time. A posed picture of the three packing tractors. I said to somebody, at some point, I want to program a tractor so that it will be without a person in it packing the silo. And you will pre-program where that pack tractor will be. There'll have to be a hell of a big kill switch someplace in case something goes wrong. Um, interior of one of our barns, um, insulated, insulated uh, ceiling, um, extremely comfortable. Um, four ladies in waiting, um, cows have calves all the time. Oh, look at that, there's two of them. Fed, ready for nap, done with mom. Um, this is the first of our, uh, the first iteration of manure, manure injector, we're now on number three. And this is uh, the uh, mixer wagon, um, and that's a posed picture of some of our manure equipment. I'm really not too excited about that great thing that says Hool on the, on the edge, because that means there's a lot of diesel fuel going up and down the road not doing much. All right, so I'm going to leave you with one last thing. Um, we didn't build a digester, and we thought we I thought we were going to. So why am I here talking today about sustainability and climate change when I am totally on board, which I am totally on board with, and yet we didn't build a digester? John, I'm so happy you went first. He just basically <laughs> took... Okay, here's a quick timeline background. The year was 2000. We were 95% liquid manure. We were either pumping or hauling our manure. Um, we were not incorporating it. Odor was a huge issue. Uh, to this day, I apologize to the neighbors for how terrible it was. I'd always, I have always had a great interest in digestion. I thought it was a great technology. I convinced my partners back then to allow me to actively pursue a digester. And quite frankly, it wasn't that hard to, to get a fair amount of capital for it. Did an in-depth uh, financial and managerial analysis on a digester. And as luck would have it, I read an article about drag hosing. Never heard of it. Peter Wright um, might have had something to do with this. I'm going, wait a minute. You can pump 1,000 gallons a minute into the ground of manure, and your neighbors don't know about it, and there's no odor. We did a rather quick uh, comparative analysis between digesting and purchasing drag hose equipment, and obviously we purchased the drag hose equipment. Um, so why? Uh, digester would have diverted a scarce commodity on our farm, which is management. There is this emerging technology, which solved our odor issue. Uh, Digesters just aren't a part of our core business. We run our dairy farm, we make milk, that's how we make our money. At that point in time, digester success rates were around 15%. Gee, why wouldn't I want to get in something that's got that kind of success rate? <laughs> um, I actually did have 100% confidence that we would be able to uh, uh, install, operate, and maintain one. Um, maybe be as a little egotistical, but anyway. Um, but what I didn't see at the time was a long-term economic signal from society that they were willing to pay for or subsidize, which I really don't like that word, the daily operating cost associated with running a digester. 
So in closing, trying to figure out a cool way to close, Stephen Hawking, what a brilliant guy. Quote from Stephen Hawking, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. Um, so my last slide. <coughs> it's a sign of change on our farm. Um, that was the day Hardy Farms sign came down and the Walnut Ridge sign went up. Um, it was obviously, you can tell, quite emotional. Um, so my challenge to you, the dairy industry, will be to see where society wants to be in five years. Not where they want us to be, but where society wants to be in five years. Then we need to get there first. Let's stop being reactionary. Let's start being proactive. Thank you.